simple offering, but with love, I accept it. But whatever you give without love, without devotion, is not accepted by Sri Krishna. So this is the first thing. Before you take a step, you should put your hand on your heart and think, am I is this activity instigated by love or not? So everything that we should do should be done lovingly. With love for Krishna and affection for his devotees. Otherwise Krishna will never accept it. And all the problems in the interactions and organization, everything, just stem from this one small thing. Huh? That a devotee has forgotten what it means to be a devotee and why he is doing devotional service. It is for love and should be done with whatever mm, devotion we can muster. Always. This is the main thing. So keep that in mind. Another question? Yes, Sweetie? Um, Gurudev, uh, Gurudev um, I always have this question, like, what is the meaning of the Maha Mantra? Like, we read about Nam Tattva and, you know, like, the Bhakti Tattva, but, like, exactly, like, the meaning of the You cannot say the meaning. Hmm? Because Krishna and Krishna's name are the same. So as Krishna is unlimited, Krishna's Nam is also unlimited. Hmm? And also because... <coughs> Today we were speaking about Dwani. So the Dwani of any verse of Srimad Bhagavatam or of any name of Krishna is also unlimited. So for those who are, who are Rasik, they are always absorbed in the Dwani. That's why one, someone may say, you're chanting the same mantra every day, why don't you chant another mantra for a change? <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that this mantra is fresh and new every day for the Rasik Vaishnavas because they're sinking into f more and more further Dwanis of the name of Krishna. Hmm? But to speak of the Dwani, even the Abhidabriti, even the direct meaning of the name, don't even go to the Dwani, it's just the direct meaning, uh, can be, the etymology can be uh, derived in so many ways. Like Krishna comes from the Krishdatu, Karshati, he attracts. So Krishna attracts, how? By playing his flute. He attracts the creepers and the, the birds and the, the cows. Hmm? and the coward boys and the gopis and the radhika so every, uh, all this is in the dwani the dwani the anudwani the prati dwani hmm? the reverberation and the reverberation of the reverberation and the reverberation of the reverberation of the reverberation <laughs> uh, so it's there but also we can say that krishdatu can be formulated in the active uh, sense karshati he attracts but it can be formulated in a passive sense Krishnatu means that person who is attracted by Radharani. So Krishna means the one who is attracted by Radharani. So even etymology, without even going into the Dwani and so on. Huh? So those who are Rasik, they are always sinking in this Nama Sudha Rasa Gayo Krishna Yasha. Hmm? Rako Vachana Manamur at the end of Vibhavarisha Srila Bhakti Nautaku says, Oh my dear mind, always the taste is unlimited rasa of the holy names nama shuddha rasa so but uh, until a person is advanced they will not taste this so you have to have some meaning just to begin with so my Gurudev has uh, uh, written a book it's called um, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and there there are many commentaries so there's a commentary of Srila Bhakti Note Thakur which is a very good explanation of each word of the mantra um, for a beginning level and then there is also the commentary of Gopal Guru Goswami which is uh, more uh, profound and then there's a commentary of Jiva Goswami which is more profound goes expresses more pastimes uh, implied by the Maha Mantra and then finally there's a commentary of Raghunath Das Goswami which is so confidential it's only in Sanskrit in my Gurudev's book with no translation. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to know that confidence, you can learn Sanskrit. Well, what I may tell you one day. Actually, I gave a class in Munger Mandir last year explaining this. So, um, so you can start with this. Because you have no Harinam yet. At the time of giving Harinam, we are explaining these things. So when you receive your Harinam, then you'll know. Okay.
<laughs> but you can have a preview by going to that book. From the book you can collect the information. But the realization will come by hearing. Uh, yes, Harsha. Uh, I've heard in your lectures when I was in Vrindavan. Harsha means full of jubilation. <laughs> Are you full of jubilation? <laughs> I want that you will really live up to your name, Harsha. <laughs> uh, you, I mean, I could be wrong in exactly stating. You said in your lectures, Parkia, Parkia Bhav or Parkia means the hero is surrendering to the heroine. Something like that you said. Can you please elaborate? I didn't understand that. No, no. Parkia. Parakya means that transgressing all the boundaries of dharma, the uh, heroine leaving her all worldly dharma responsibility, shame, shyness and the censure of society, transgresses the boundaries of dharma to meet with her beloved with whom she's not married. So this is called Parakya. So Parakya Bhav has two types. It's called Poroda and Kanya. So the gopis who are Kanya, that means unmarried virgins. Hmm? An unmarried girl should not meet with a, with a boy. She should not meet with anyone before her marriage. So they are also, though they are not married to someone else other than Krishna, they're also Parakya, they're also transgressing Dharma to meet with him. So, so Kanya Bhav is one aspect of Parikya and the other aspect is Paroda Bhav. Paroda. So mm, Paroda means that she's actually married to someone but then she meets with someone she's not married with. She meets with Krishna with whom she's not married. So that's called Paroda. It comes from Ba Datu. Ba Datu in Sanskrit. From this Ba Datu comes Bibaha. Bibaha. Mm. Ba. Ba means to carry, to carry a burden. So when a man marries a woman, that is called bivaha, marriage, because the man is making a vow to ba, to carry the burden of the responsibility of that woman for his whole life. In other words, he's responsible to provide her with a house and clothing and food and ornaments and children and, and take care of the children and everything. So vivaha, the vow to carry the all the responsibility for the kanya who has been donated by her father hmm? so um, so from baha comes udha and then para udha para means another so the the hero who is relishing the meeting with the paroda nayak na, uh, naika that heroine paroda naika means that he is enjoying the heroine whose burden, Uddha, is being carried para by someone else. So that's called Paroda. Yeah. So Parakya is this, and it has two aspects, Kanya Bhav and Paroda Bhav. So we, we, our objective within Parakya is Paroda Bhav, because Srila Bhakti Nautakos said, Brashabhanu Pura Janamalaibo Javata Bibaha Ahabe. When will I take birth in Varsana, and when I come of age, my hand will be given in marriage to a coward boy in yeah. Yavat. So our Nityasiddha Bhav that we're aiming for is the uh, Paroda aspect of Parakya. So in, in Swakya, in the married relationship, the wife has to be submissive to the husband. That may come as a surprise to everyone, <laughs> but that is the traditional Vedic um, situation because the husband is older and he's become financially established and, and the, the wife, she's just come out of childhood and just ended into marriageable age so she's ready to have children. She's just at the beginning of being ready to have children. So there's a, they're not on an equal status in Swakya. But in Parakya, there's, a, there's not exactly a, only an equal status because Radhika is more or less Krishna's age. She's just like one year and 15 days younger. But um, because actually she should not meet with him, then he's dependent on her mercy to have the chance to meet with her. 
So generally in parakia mood, the hero is submissive to the heroine. So it's the, it's the other way around than fr from Swakia. So the submissiveness of the hero to the heroine isn't parakia, but that's one of the features of parakia. Mm -hmm. Yes, Thank a you, question? Okay. Yes, Ram Das Prabhu. Um, and how are, the, how are the Manjaris in that mm -hmm. situation? Um, Sula Vishnantavi Thakur in his Ananda Chandrika commentary on Ujjwani Nilamani said it depends on the on the um, on the bhav with which a devotee does bhajan so some of those who are in maidservant's mood um, consider that they're not married they're doing Kanya bhav and others doing Paroda bhav but because we are Rupanuga we follow Rupa Goswami then we do bhajan in Paroda bhav in Vilapka Samanjali there Sula Raghunath Dasa Swami has written Hey Rupa Manjari, you are very famous in our village as being a very chaste lady. You never look at the face of a man other than your husband. But your husband, I know he's been away for some days in another village uh, looking to uh, buy some very uh, good pedigree cows to increase the quality of his livestock. And he's been away for a few days and he did not return yet. But still, I'm seeing some mark on your lip. What happened? Perhaps a, a parrot can mistook your lips for a fresh bimba fruit and pecked it. So here you can see that Srila uh, Vishnu Tengtaku gives this as an example in his Ananda Chandrika commentary to prove that Rupa Manjari is actually married. Hmm. And so being the followers of Rupa Goswami, this is also that, that element is there in our... Um, the, Sudden, we want that nitya siddha bhav in paroda bhav. Mm. This is a follow-up question, Gurudev. So, wait, wait. Maybe he has a follow-up okay, question. Okay, sorry, very sorry. Mm. Yes. Okay. Uh, what implications does it have on the final picture? It's a big implication. Mm. If you are if you are married, you live in your mother-in-law's house, and if you are unmarried, you live in your mother's house. So it's a big, very big implication. <coughs> You'll be in Varsana instead of you'll be living in Varsana instead of living in Yavat. The, everything is more difficult in Parodhava. Mm. So more obstacles. Uh, they uh, they don't create the love, but they they uh, create the situation for the power of the love to be more clearly manifested. So yeah. obstacles are inna innate to the parakya mood, and in Parodabhav the obstacles are more extreme. Mm. Any more question? Thank you. Yes? That means all the manjaris are in Parodhava or...? No, I just said that. It um, but Rati Manjari? Yes. Uh, she is always following Rupa Manjari, so yes. she is yes. yes. not Kanya, right? No, they are married. Characters like Abhimanya and his mother Jatila, how do we understand what their relationship is with Krishna, with their experiences? In Braja, everyone loves Krishna. Even Jatila loves Krishna. But uh, she has responsibility as a mother-in-law to protect the, rep the reputation of her family and her daughter-in-law. So she's always on the lookout to make sure, because the, see, the son of Nandamraj has a, a terrible reputation. There are so many rumors that he has uh, compromised the integrity of gopis of Vrindavan, and that sure as hell is not going to happen to my daughter-in-law. <laughs> this is Jutila's move, you see. So it's because she loves Radhika, and because she also loves Krishna, but she's a Guruja, and she's an older person, and she has to make sure that the young generation don't get up to no good <laughs> right so it's very it's very sweet but of course the the uh, and radhika understands that the sakis understand that but still they see them uh, for in terms of how they will live in such a way to fully please krishna so these personalities are obstacles they're not obstacles because they're <coughs> mm, vindictive or malicious or anything. But that's 
who that's their responsibility in society as well so they have very difficult characters jutila jutila means it's like if you have long hair and you don't comb your hair then what happens it goes into dreadlocks so once it goes into a matted lock you just you can't straighten it out ever again so jutila means the word jat means a dreadlock hmm? so jutila means that person who in any situation becomes involved any simple situation she becomes involved it becomes so entangled and so complicated no one can untangle it so her name is jutila <laughs> Hmm? Kutila. Kutila means crooked. A crooked person is always looking for faults. So if you make, if there's a palace which is carved from one diamond, from one jewel, then it will have no cracks. But if you put an ant there, the ant ants always looking for cracks. It's nature. So though there's no fault in the jewel-like personality of Shimati Radhika, but Kutila is always looking for some cracks, some dosh, some fault in Radhika. Hmm? Abhimanyu. Abhiman means proud and angry. So uh, he often becomes proud and angry, upset and shouting. So, but they are all, in the final picture, all the personalities of Braj are sweet and they are all Rasa Samagri. That means they're all the, the, ingri, the ing, Rasa Upakar, sorry. They're all Rasa Upakar. If you want to make mm, Sherbet, you need water as the base, you need some lemon juice, but then you have to give some camphor as well, you have to put something sharp, like some black pepper as well. So there are sweet ingredients, but there's also something hot as well, the black pepper. But when they're all mixed together, it makes one sherbet which is delicious. So in this way, some persons in Braj are very directly sweet. Huh? And some are hot and fiery like Abhi Manu. But when you put the whole thing together, it's all the Leela of Braj is delicious. <laughs> so they are the Rasupakara. Mm. Yes. Another question. Yeah. Gurdiv, um, how can we stay engaged in our worldly worldly dharmas to the extent that we require required to do so without becoming absorbed in them and continuing to progress on the path of bhakti mm -hmm. by being sincere mm -hmm. being sincere that means that we actually mean what we say mm -hmm. when we want to be, be a devotee and we want to serve krishna then we'll minimize our uh, uh, preoccupation with worldly things. We'll do only what's necessary in a sense of duty, like an actor on a stage even, uh, with detachment, not moved by success and failure, profit, loss, victory and defeat, honor and dishonor. So we do them with a very steady mind, with equilibrium. So then it, when it comes, we come to do bhajan, the mind is not full of turbulence of the dualities that we were facing in the other activities. So if one is sincere, then they'll do that. But if one is insincere, then uh, one will have attraction to things other than Sri Krishna and, be, and necessarily become absorbed. We become absorbed in those things that we desire. If we didn't desire them, we wouldn't become absorbed in them. So it's a question of sincerity. And also, one of the side effects of practicing a strong sadhana is shubhada, auspiciousness in one's life. So at first, our life is not so auspicious. We are overburdened by many obstacles. But if you try to chant nicely and do your sadhana nicely every day, mm -hmm. as you progress, then Krishna will rearrange your life that the obstacles become less and less. Mm -hmm. Hmm? So, you know, it's not possible to be engaged 23 hours a day in doing karmic activities and then say, how will I not be absorbed for the last one hour? Right? You can't, you, you, you can't do that. So, um, the actual components of our life, the proportions of how much we're engaged in the worldly activities out of apparent necessity, and how much we're engaged in the devotional activities, the proportions will change, that the devotional activities become more and more, 
and then the worldly responsibilities become less and less. And that will co come as a side effect of your sincere efforts to do sadhana. Shubhada, auspiciousness comes in life. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that actually the worldly responsibilities are not, they're not as threatening or, or, or urgent as we may consider them to be. If you, do, if you do nothing, you just sit at home and you just chant all the time and read and have kirtan, everything you need will come by itself. But we don't believe that right now, so we have to go through the slow, <laughs> through the slow step by step process of gradually changing the proportions. Hmm? But one who has strong sraddha, hmm, then he will realize that Lord Brahma created the whole, whole universe only by the abbas, by the semblance of the vibration of calm beach. Hmm? the seed of the calm Gayatri. So if Brahma can create everything in the universe only by the reflection of the seed of calm Gayatri, if Gurudev has given you calm Gayatri and you're remembering this beach hmm, so many times every day, then what, what will not be the result of that? Hmm? Whatever you need. There's a power there, more powerful than all the universes in that mantra. So there's nothing to worry about. If you're worried about that, then you're an atheist. <laughs> you don't believe in God. So there's two ways to answer that question. I gave both of them. Okay. So first we should try to be sincere and walk by the gradual path. And uh, it's good if you can come to Vrindavan, come to Navadvi, Puri, come to Parakrama in India, and there at least for a week or two weeks or a whole month or so or two months you can experience the total surrender program hmm? and then go back to your life because uh, such um, opportunity will come for more profound realization at that time and then when you go back to the some worldly responsibilities it will be so much easier because you have that internal nourishment and once those samskars, those impressions are there, as soon as you sit down to chant, then just by the name of Krishna, they're all awakened again. So it's not like you're not feeling, you're not feeling as if you're always starting from the beginning. But there's a really accumulative effect. Mm -hmm. Where you, 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 every day when you sit down, even if you're North Carolina, but you sit down, hey Krishna, and you'll say, oh, yeah, I'm at Giraj Govata. Mm -hmm. I'm at Danivatan Kund. Mm -hmm. I'm at Radha Kund. I'm in Seva Kunj. Hmm? I'm in Kamiyavan. Like this, and the impressions will come very strongly. So even when you're not with the Guru and with Vaishnavas and in the Holy Dharma, but the impressions that you collected there will be, have a very powerful uh, effect on your practice when you're here also. So even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, before the stage of Nishta, before the steadiness, <coughs> To make an external show of complete renunciation will very often not be effective. So, krami krami pai bhava loka sindhuku, go step by step. Try to cultivate your internal nishta. Antare kori nishta bahi loka bhyavaha achirati krishna tomai kori be uda. Mahapu said, outwardly behave like an ordinary person and internally cultivate your nishta, your steadiness in bhakti. Mm -hmm. And when you become steady, Krishna himself will rearrange everything. There, is, there are no obstacles at all. This is the balanced and mature understanding. <coughs> so everyone, please come and join us on um, <laughs> February the 24th until March the 1st for Navadip Parikrama and then up to March 15th for Brindavan Retreat. Who's coming? Okay, Who's coming? Yes, sir. Okay. The, yes, you may have already answered the question in some way, way many ways. And uh, but when I hear you speaking, and the answers you're giving, they're profound. Um, just take for example, when we talk about sadhana, we hear the word sadhana thrown around so often, and people are sincere. They're saying, "Do your sadhana," but we, I don't see. <coughs> The, the focus, just like the, the nice answer you gave to Vishaka here, you know, it's like, 
how there's a gap between how we use sadhana and how we do sadhana, how we have faith in if we could just sit in one place and have everything come, but we don't have it. So, so there's a gap here, and when we're with a uh, really nice association, good association of a of a of a of a, of a super excellent Vaishnava, the gap seems to be filled. But then when we get in other situations, this gap, you know, we hear, we, then we get back to the, I'm going to do my sadhana, and it's sort of casual. Uh, How do we, you know, seriously, <laughs> you know, you know uh, fill those gaps? It's up? only casual because the past impressions of sloppy japa are there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because of habitu practicing habitually in a casual way. So then when you come to practice again, due to past habits, you practice in a casual way again, you see? And so that, uh, the, the habit makes impressions, and then we're under the control of those impressions. And that's why we try to um, create an environment where everyone can develop new habits. And they will produce deep impressions in turn, and then our practice will change. And so that's why this morning I sat with everyone in Japa to make that impression. No sloppy Japa. Sloppy Japa is a poison. It is you, you are destroying your life. You have to do with a full surrender and uh, full dedication. Let's say a person says, I have some difficulties, some obstacles in my life, I cannot fully surrender. When you take your Japa Mala, now fully surrender. No one's stopping you. Mm. You can completely surrender to Krishna's holy name. At least for that time of the day. And Krishna will accept that spirit. And you remain in the mood of surrender throughout the some, somewhat external things. But Krishna knows in your heart you. Because surrender is of two types. Hmm? Atmanivedam is, is of two types. It can be of the, of the heart, of the soul, and it can be of the bodily activities. So full surrender is both. But if bodily there are some obstacles in heart, we can fully surrender, and Krishna accepts it. And then the uh, the outer manifestation can come later, as well. So it's all about impressions, the impressions that we have, because we've associated with persons who are very casual in their understanding or their practice. We develop that habit by association. Hmm? So when we associate with those who are the exact opposite of casual who are very intense and very focused in their sadhana, then this makes an impression and then we develop that habit mm -hmm. as well. So this is why I've uh, written the, this book, The First Aid for Chanting Japa, because this verse uh, explains all the components of casualness and how to overcome them. What is the antidote for all casual thinking? Mm -hmm. hmm? So sakshi kala tita drishya for sakshi, I am a witness. The sakshi means I am a I am not this body and I am not this mind. Unless you are situated in shakshitwa, in this from you are looking at your own mind, from the perspective of being a detached witness of your mind, then you must identify with it. So when you sit down to chant japa and you are preoccupied with worldly anxieties, oh. What about I need this money and I need to go shopping and I have to go online and it, like this. It means that you're not situated in shakshitwa. That you're identifying with your mind instead of watching your own mind from the vantage point of your soul. Which is called shakshitwa, witnesshood. Being a witness. So just the first word of the verse solves 95% of all of your japa problems. Hmm? Then kalatit. Kalatit means I am beyond time. Because we sit to chat and after 10 minutes, like I want to get up or I want to we look around, I want to talk to someone, after 10 minutes. Because the Rajagun is in the mind and it makes us restless. We're not Kalatit, beyond, but we are Kalatit, we are beyond time. You sit down, I have forever, because I'm eternal. Don't be impatient, don't feel the urges to do anything else. You're doing Japa now, you've agreed, you sat down, I gave my hundred dollars, I'm going to chant now for three hours. <laughs> and if I, if I move, he'll keep the hundred dollars. Hmm? So if I want that hundred dollars back, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to move. Hmm? Like this. So kalatit, be beyond time. Shakshi kalatita drisha means, this is very important, drisha means, 
Though I am the Shakshi, I may be the witness of, towards the material energy, but I am not the witness of spiritual things. Everything which is spiritual, all Aprakata Vastu, are not the objects of my vision, but I am the object of the vision of the Aprakata Vastu. I cannot see Prasadam. Prasadam is looking at me. I cannot see the deity of Krishna. Krishna is, can look at me. I cannot see here Harinam. Harinam can see me. We have to change our, uh, adjust our position in relation to all the transcendental things. Because if you think that you are the witness of the transcendental things, then what you're thinking is transcendental, it's actually material. Because all which is transcendental is, is above us and beyond us. Aprakrita. Hmm? The holy name, the Vaishnavas, the we cannot see these things, they can see us. Only by their mercy can they reveal themselves. So only the first time, Sakshi Kala, Tita, Drisha, so many problems have been destroyed in your japa and you become properly adjusted in relation to the holy name. Hmm? So I told that there's three more lines, so just read the book <laughs> carefully. When we make a japa retreat, I'll go through the whole book, line by line. Hmm? It will, it will fix many, many problems. Uh, and the, casual, the casualness is there, mm, solved completely. Jivanasando. Jivanasando means the junction between life and death. Mm. All japa takes place in the junction between life and death. Only. Only that person who is fully aware that just now I will die mm, can chant japa. Because everyone else says, I will live forever, so I am going to focus on worldly things. But when you, um, you, should, when you chant Japa, you should practice dying every day. This is the last moment of my life. This may be the last mantra that I ever utter. This may be the last time I ever say Krishna. And chant every syllable of the mantra as if it's your last. Then where's the casual na nature of Japa? Gone? No? So please, learn this verse, read this, try to follow what I've written in this book, First Aid for Chanting Japa. All the sloppiness will be finished. Uh, yes, Ram um, um You say something about um, free will. In this situation, Krishna's in control of everything. But So how does my free will enter into that? The spiritual energy hmm, is under God's control and the material energy is under God's control and you are controlled by one or the other. So which one you are controlled by, that's your free will. Hmm. Hmm. So if you surrender to Maya by your free will, then your ego will dictate what you will do according to your impressions you will, whatever you want to do, someone will smoke a cigarette, someone will go to the cinema, someone, will, whatever. All these, it's they're under the control of the past impressions which are there in Prakriti. So the Prakriti is controlling them, but it was their free will that they surrendered to Prakriti. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you surrender to Guru and come under the control of the spiritual energy. Mm -hmm. So in this way control is there and free will is also there. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, but our free will is it's, a, it's very minute, it's limited in the sense that unless our consciousness is clear then we don't understand the options and we just go along in a, like a, in a sleeping state with whatever the mature energy is doing. So if a person is very much in Rajas or in Tamagun, if they're in Tamagun they have potentially free will but they never express it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a person in Rajagun then he thinks, I want to do this, but his senses are forcing him to do something else. So there's a minute manifestation of the inherent free will, the kartritta, it's called kartritta, agenthood. The soul has kartritta, agenthood. So, but in, in the mode of passion, there's an experience, oh, I want to do this, but my senses are forcing me to do that. And then in the mode of goodness, I want to do this, and the senses are quite, they're not disturbing me, so I'll do it. Mm, and go away. And so you can do austerity in, in the mode of goodness. And when one is under the shelter of bhakti, then bhakti makes him chant and remember and everything is going on with great taste. Uh, so our 
uh, free will is not absolute, it's uh, limited, it's curtailed by the level of ignorance that we have, the level of avidya. And as we slowly become free from avidya, then our potential free will becomes manifest. And so that's when, when you asked, how do we do this? I said, sincerity. So sincerity is when you're aware that you have a choice between Maya and Krishna, and you choose Krishna. That's sincerity. And even if you choose Krishna, but you can't do it because the mode of passion, your senses are out of control. Mm -hmm. At least you, were, you did the wrong thing with awareness of what was right. Mm -hmm. And that's also purifying. Mm -hmm. And gradually, gradually, you will be purified of the wrong thing and also do the right thing as well. Mm -hmm. So that's Krishna's question in, in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3. Chris, Arjun says to Krishna, uh, by what is one in, impelled to perform sinful acts as if by force against one's will? So he's speaking about that state when a person wants to, is sincere and they want to do the right thing, but their senses force them to do the wrong thing. And he said, what's that? And Krishna said, Kama, Esha, Kroda, Esha, Rajaguna, Samudbhava. It is the force of Rajagun. Abritam Jnana, Maitaina, Jnani, No, Nityavarina. So this Rajagun makes Ajnan, ignorance. And therefore one just hasn't the, the strength to uh, uh, tread the spiritual path, even if he wants to. But gradually, uh, by uh, reading Bhagavad Gita, hearing from Vaishnavas, cultivating Vivek, the habit of being discriminating mm -hmm. in all of one's activities, and the purification of chanting the holy name, gradually a strength will come and one will make all the right choices. Hmm. So free will is there and control is there. And actually in the spiritual energy, I say yes, uh, Krishna controls the spiritual energy, but really he doesn't. Mm. Lord Narayan can. Lord Narayan is God and He controls. But Krishna gives full independence to Yoga Maya and to Bhakti Devi. And, and they control Him. And He likes that. Mm -hmm. But they control Him according to His desire. So there's a difference between being mm, not in control, but the entire existence is doing everything to fulfill your desire. So he's still Ishwara Parama Krishna, his supreme controller in that sense, but not directly, because he's given Swatantrata, independence to his Bhakti Shakti. Mm. 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 Okay, we'll have one more question for this particular visit. Yes. Everybody has their levels of bhajan, right? And and uh, in all the guru parampara. So we've had so many great gurus. So where where would we be? In in the, I mean, there there's no way we would ever you know reach that level of you know uh, of what has been done. So mm -hmm. you know where where, do, where would we stand at the end after doing whatever little devotion we can do? Mm. Well, don't be so defeatist. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's an eternal line of demarcation between the Savior and the saved. So we are saved by our saviors in the Guru Parampara. And we can never be equal to them. Yet, uh, they come to this world to perform the pastime of showing us, the exam giving the example of how we should be. So we should aspire for that. Mm -hmm. We may not have the intensity of their love, but the way that they have done sadhana, we should try to do that. Mm -hmm. The scripture never prescribes a goal which cannot be attained. Mm -hmm. And the scripture never gives a practice which cannot be practiced to attain the goal. Also, as well. And so we should not think that everything is always out of reach. Our goal is reachable, otherwise our acharyas would not recommend it. And the sadhan to reach that goal is doable, otherwise they would not tell us to do it. Hmm. So though we may be in the junior position now, and will remain always in Anugacha under their guidance, but we can have a very excellent sadhana one day. And if you cannot have an excellent sadhana every day, days like this, Akadasi, make a special effort to do more. Hmm? 
to chant more on a Kadasi or Janmastami or any special festival day. Try to be more engaged in service. And then you can have a more profound experience. And you'll take that with you even to the days when your sadhana is perhaps not to that extent. So don't uh, don't make excuses to be weak. <laughs> Criticize. Don't say, well, it's okay and it's all impossible. No, it's not okay and it's not impossible. Do it. Do or die. <laughs> okay. Do or die. <laughs> My good dad used to say this. We must attain perfection. We try. In this life or next life, or, but we try to do the best we can. So if your situation is such you cannot do the best every day, when you have a day, some days off from your responsibility, then try. And I know it's difficult because material energy is very strong and we are weak. But if you come into good association, then you'll see that you become carried along in the wake. If you're in the association of a Vaishnava who is moving very quickly, yato pagiyate, mm -hmm. hmm? he's going to, he's on the way to Goloka Prandava and get in the wake of that Vaishnava and you'll see he, he's t removing all the resistance. <laughs> <laughs> see, we, you know, like a water ski, you know, the, the water ski has no engine, but he's holding on to the speedboat. <laughs> And the speedboat is going, and then the water ski is also going. <laughs> so you hold on very tightly to the lotus feet of, of Guru and Gauranga, and you also go quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gaur Premanandi!